been here for 30 years, but I'm here now, and I got lot, I've had lots of lessons uh, to maybe share that would help you, you because you can try to avoid some of the mistakes I've made in 30 years of trying to uh, start a business and you know based on software and uh, developing something which uh, actually has an international audience. Um, I guess the, the first thing I would say is that you got to find something that you like or that you're curious about or that you want to want to work on if you're going to develop a business enterprise uh, that you're primarily going to run rather than rely upon somebody else to boss you around. Uh, I don't like to be told what to do, so it was only natural that nobody would want to hire me and I had to find you know, something as an alternative. So uh, I, I, I tried it when I moved, moved to San Diego in about 1981 or so to get a programming job. And I got some uh, in languages that you've never heard of which I had to learn quickly and try to produce something, and it wasn't very fruitful. And then when I didn't work, uh, didn't want to work for very low wages, why well, you know there were no more jobs. So I ended up trying to figure out a way to to make money pursuing something that I was always curious about. Now, now my background, and see, each of you has your own background, and you want to try to figure out what I'm saying that might relate to something uh, in your background. Uh, yeah, no. Before I went moved to San Diego, I uh, worked for the state of Washington. And before I worked for the state of Washington, I was an unemployed teacher. So a uh, college teacher who no one would hire. Because it uh, was in the, the 70s and the demand for teaching was, uh, for new, new teachers was very low. So like you, I went to a community college and I took computer programming. You know, that was, I went to Olympia Technical Community College in Olympia, Washington. And uh, I learned Fortran, and I learned uh, uh, COBOL, and finally found a job with the state of Washington. And they let me do a lot of analysis and programming, which made it interesting. I programmed, and I also analyzed what the numbers meant uh, for child protection and also for uh, uh, the Labor Department. So that was cool. But uh, it was also working for the state. And you see the skies out here we had today? That was the Olympia, Washington, on a, on a great day. It was always gray, always gloomy, and you know, so I got tired of 31 flavors of gray. And I, and I they sent me down for a conference in San Diego uh, for part of doing some statistical work that they liked. And it was in the middle of winter. And it was palm trees and pretty girls, and you know that made me want to come down here. So in 1981, I. The, the, child protection job ended and I decided to come down here. But as I said, I couldn't find a job. So what did I do? Well, uh, I decided I would be the first kid on the block to have an Apple II Plus. And Apple II Plus is probably you've seen in maybe some place in a museum. But I actually bought one for $3,000. And it had 36, I think, K of memory. It was very slow. I mean, it would read in uh, files so slowly you could you could have a cheese sandwich while you're waiting for the numbers to, to finally be put in the computer's memory to, to produce a graph. And I, I was interested in the stock market for a long time, so I thought, well, this rich people have all the money, right? It's even truer now. It was also true in the 80s, because I, I had a certain amount of resentment uh, for how, how my, my situation and, and how much money was out there that I couldn't avail, avail myself of or get, get jobs from. So, I, so I, I've been interested in the stock market for a long time. Ever since I, I was in graduate school, you know, in Columbia years ago, and I had a roommate from Israel, and he had a very, very well-known uncle. And his uncle uh, had written between parents and child and between ch parents and parents or something, Haim Ganat. Well, Haim would call David, and he would say, he'd call him, and he would say, is David there? No. Well, tell David to buy, buy Boeing. Boeing's going to go up. So Boeing did go up. And I heard that, I heard many recommendations that Haim gave to David, and they would all go up. And I, of course, wanted to find out more about this. And I so I went to the business library, and I began to read uh, books on the stock market. And that fit in with my statistical benefit. Now, I don't know what each of your aptitudes are, but years ago, my grandfather ran the numbers in a factory in Cincinnati, where I grew up. And he, numbers meant that there was a payoff every week based, in his, his case, on the number of 
of uh, runs scored in the National League and the American League. So when I was like you know six or seven years old, he was telling me about his adventures with baseball scores and what, what it meant. And that guy he taught me how to add. And so I was the quickest kid in the class to add numbers and subtract numbers. And so I got good at math because of that. So I thank him for that. I don't think there's any way you can know what connect, how connections are going to lead one to another. But each of you, you know, has your own abilities. And you, you ought to figure out you know, what those are and try to uh, use compu computers to help you. Probably have some math apps where you wouldn't be in here. So anyway, I did something that nobody had done with an Apple II Plus before back in 1981. I put into the computer like a crazy man. I went to the library and I went to the microfilm machines. I put in something like 30,000 pieces of data for the stock market to try to see if uh, I could learn something that I could sell to people that had a lot of money. And I did discover things. So was, I looked at the data for between 1970 and 1981, and it, it was revelatory. I and mean, it opened up new things that nobody knew about the stock market. And why is that? Well, because the stock market, and I worked on Wall Street briefly, is based on, on tips and who you know and running around, you know, sharing that information and trading it. And it's also based on not just insider information, but some illegal activities. Like the, the, there was a Jewish mafia back when I when I was uh, involved in these things, and I had a I had a new guy who was in it, and all his recommendations would go up, you know, one after another, because they were rigging the stocks. So that taught me that the stock market is definitely riggable, you know, in some cases. So that opened my mind to something that maybe you've been told, but it's the truth. I also found, and of course rumors are important too, I also found that the, the people that run the brokerages are hardly ethical or hardly put their clients' interests first. Because when I was in the research department at this company that became Smith Barney, which became something else, you know, 30 years later, uh, a telegram came in. The, the new trainees, the brokers, uh, work in the research department. A, a telegram came in from uh, Indonesia about a company called Natomas. And Natomas was a shipping company that nobody had any interest in. But suddenly, Natomas had a big interest in a major oil find in Indonesia. You know, Indonesia now is a big oil producer. Well, Natomas was right in at the, at the beginning floor of that. And I thought, as this telegram came in, well, wow, aren't I lucky? I'm going to see how this information is disseminated to all the clients and, and, and recommendations, and I can watch the stock go up, and it'll be real interesting. I waited and waited. The stock was not recommended. It was not recommended, not recommended. Then I found that what happened is the partners in this company, Harris Upham, Mr. Harris and Mr. Upham, took big position in, in, in themselves, and they just sat on it. And the information was not disseminated to anybody else, and so the stock had already doubled. So what that tells you, tells me, and should tell you, is that if we could identify when the partners or somebody who's knowledgeable about some inside information, take positions in a stock, good things uh, might happen because we could get in on the bottom floor soon afterwards too. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do. Now, uh, so you can't be too cynical about Wall Street. I think that's the first lesson. Professionals manipulate things and, and insider trading is rampant. And that doesn't even mention the Swiss bank accounts or the political power that Wall Street has to perpetuate their benefits. So, but you, all, you already probably already know that. The question is now, uh, you know, how do we, what are we going to do about it, and how are you going to uh, use information that I can give you to try to uh, improve your own lives? Uh, Henry, Hank Emmis, uh, was, and I were talking coming over here, and it's obvious people can't afford, you know, anymore to live in San Diego. One quarter of the people are are behind the curve economically in San Diego. So, you know, I'm sure that's a lot a lot of people here. And I know a lot of them, and I care about them. You know, they they should have better a better deal. Well, the temptation when you when you fall behind is to find is to go out to Barona or to find some way to make quick money, right? When you can't meet uh, meet your rent or maybe go to loan shark. I don't know. But what you what you don't want to do too quickly is to listen to a stockbroker who may call on you or who you may call them. And, and say, gee, I just heard about XYZ stock, or I see that you're you recommending XYZ stock. Sure, i got to have money. I've got to make a little money. You say that'll work out. Super. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But you want to use what I'm going to show you, or something like it, to try to avoid some of the, you know, some of the most awful things that could occur. 
because if you get desperate, you take chances, and you and you can find yourself, you know, out on the street, literally, if if you can't make the, you know, the rent payments or so on. So when you get desperate or you things are, are tough, you can't make money in Wall Street, but you got to know what you're doing, right? Now that's my take on things. Now each of you has your own take on something that matters to you. I, you know, don't. I write about Wall Street negatively all the time, so I, you know, that's my way of reconciling what I do and, and uh, how much Wall Street makes in the way of these things. But I think that you know you you have to figure out your own values, and, and to some extent, we all live in the heart of the beast, and we have to survive and, and figure out ways to make money in these circumstances. And that's what I did back in, in 82, 83. Well, anyway, um, let, me, let me come to a presentation that maybe maybe more organized. I think you should stop me if you if you really feel I've, I've misstated something and you're confused. Let's see if I can do that. Now, what I'm going to talk about, if you have a computer, you can just watch it online if you want to. Because this site I built just for you all is uh, tigersoft.com and forward slash capital I uh, intro. So it's, it's capital, tigersoft.com, which is my website, and forward slash intro. And if you go there, you're going to see the same presentation that I would begin to set out, set out for you. I'm going to look at the pictures primarily because my eyes are weak, and I'm going to try to remember what I'm supposed to say at each point. Um, you can read these things yourself. I think I've, I've said all these things here, but you want to know more specifically that we want to try to see, We know I talked about how professionals manipulate stocks and how insiders have a lot of benefit. Uh, through insider trading because it's not regulated very much. Well, if we could figure out, you know, the right patterns in the stock market, it might be really valuable, and that's what I've tried to do. And this is per particularly true in, in what's called market timing, because most stocks go up and down with the general market. And if the, I use the Dow Jones. If the Dow Jones average were to drop, say, 20 percent, which is the start of where people, most people consider a bear market, the average stock is going to fall uh, twice that. Because they, they're blue chips, that means they have low volatility. So you want to be uh, you know, aware of where the stock market is. It's especially true now because there's lots of evidence that, the, that there's been big run-ups in, in low price stocks. And the, and the run-ups in low price stocks often take place when confidence is high among, among uh, people that, that uh, want to speculate wildly. So we, if you get too much speculation, it means you're closer to a top. So we have to ask ourselves that. Second thing that makes me think that we're probably not too far away from a top, so it's particularly important to know how to recognize them, a top, and I'm going to show you that. And you can think about what would you do, each of you, what would you do if you thought a market top was uh, going to come, and you're, and you're going to get a repeat of what happened in 2007, 2008. Is there anything you could do? I don't know, but each of you might figure out what you might have done better you know, three years ago you know, to try to have avoided it had you known that was going to take place. Would you have not bought the car, you know, because prices are going to come down for that car? Or would you have uh, taken a, 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 a sure job? Maybe so, right? Now, I'm not saying we're at a top right now. I am saying that we're probably coming closer, and you may be able to see it from here. Now, and I'm going to show you how, you, how typically they occur, so that's important. Um, there's a lot more that I could say, but I, I, you may bring it out later. I don't want to go down a path that uh, takes us away from just covering things. Now, if you look at this graph, this is hourly wages, right? I don't know whether any of you are escaping this curve. I sure hope so, because education is, is the best answer for trying to escape the, the job market. If you've got something unique, they'll pay you higher prices, higher wages. If you don't have anything unique and you're not good at, really good at what you do, you know, it may be easy to get a basic job. But you're, but you're going to be put into a, one of, in, in this type of situation where the, job, the wages aren't going up. So we, have to, we know that we have to do better, and we have to supplement our incomes in the course of uh, lives here. So this, this is important. Look, what, on the other hand, what happened to Wall Street. Now, this is a graph of the, of the same, roughly the same year, same time period. So the stock market, as measured by the Dow Jones average, has doubled. Well, a lot of stocks have done a lot more than doubling, if you could have figured them out. What... I think it's vital to understand from what this graph shows is obviously uh, the rich are getting richer and the poor are not. You know, and if you want to do something about that, I'm all with you. But beyond that, you, 
you should also realize that the stock market is not directly connected to the economy. You know, you can have a stock market that goes up and the economy doesn't improve much. Maybe opposite too. But how could? You, why is it that the stock market is going up this much, and the economy is not? Well, it could be the stock market is taking all the money, because that's where that's the biggest game in town. Anybody who wants to make any money doesn't put a money doesn't uh, figure out a new way to produce, uh, you know, shoes with lights on them as Al Bundy did, it, so you can see in the dark as you walk along. You know, they they don't try. They just find they take their money and they try to get a stockbroker who's going to help them out. So the stock market is uh, is in sense a, a, a replacement for industry. So also you have a lot of uh, jobs going overseas. Well, profits are made overseas just as nicely as as in this country. So when you get a, an American company making a lot of money now in, in Indochina or wherever, in China, Formosa, wherever, uh, it counts for profits and, and that makes the stock go up. And also, the third thing is that a lot of times you find uh, the people being paid less in a, in a poor economy, right? There's that reserve of unemployed. Lots of unemployed people means you don't have to pay people that much when you hire them. So there's a disconnect between the stock market and, and Wall Street. And I guess I can think of some other things too. But that, but the, the Federal Reserve is com more complicated. But the, when, when um, if the economy was good, you'd have higher interest rates probably, and that would that would compete with the stock market. So that would help weaken the stock market. So there's all sorts of points that are made. They're not made in economics classes. When I talk economics 101, uh, I've taught a lot of good things, but I was I was told the stock market and the economy generally uh, go up together, and it ain't necessarily so. When did this not happen in the past? When was it like this in the past? When do you think the stock market went up a lot and the economy wasn't going up uh, very much also? 1928, 1929, right? Isn't that amazing? If you, look, you can look at the statistics. I love economic history because it's it, it gets away from um, you know the, the theories that are out there that sometimes try to fool you. So in 1928 and 29, the, Business production actually slowed down, and even profits weren't doing that well. But the stock market kept going up and up and up because there was lots of speculation. That was the game in town, right? So we want to watch for a top because you want to figure out what you could have done better in 2007, 2008 if you had known for sure that the market was going to go down. Maybe you have the money to speculate in, in some short sales. Fine. Maybe you should have sold your house. That would have been something to do if you had a house. Renting doesn't really matter so much. So, anyway, that's what I'm showing you in a macro way here, in a large, on a five-year basis, is also true short-term. Because a lot of times, short-term news doesn't predict stock prices. And why is that? Why, why do you think that short-term news that might not predict, that you would think would predict uh, prices going up or prices going down doesn't work out that way? Because people have already bought on the rumor and they're selling on the news. Insiders have already taken their position, and when the good news comes out, that's when they're selling to the people that they've schnookered. So you want to be really careful about buying Qualcomm or any other stock just because uh, there's good news on it. Maybe that news has already been factored in, and maybe it isn't good enough. So our programs are meant to try to help people figure out you know, how you get around that. Now, I don't know if this is of interest to you, uh, but I'm hoping it is, because it should make you very chary, very wary of Wall Street and Wake, or any authorities. This is not what they teach in, uh, you know, in economics 101 in most classes. So, but this is the truth, as, as I see it anyway, and I got lots of evidence of it. And if you go to Tigers, if you want to Google something, let's say you want to look, uh, you want to look up something. I've written for for what since since uh, the internet's come out on all sorts of subjects. So if you were interested in roses, and uh, you could see what I think about roses and TigerSoft, but that's probably not your your bag. Type in TigerSoft and insider trading, or TigerSoft and Qualcomm, or TigerSoft and you know some of these other topics that may come up, uh, and you'll see probably get a lot more information than, than you want. And but you'll at least see that there's a lot of uh, studies of these things. Now let me see what I've got here that I can show you. Uh, more things will come to mind in the way of programming as we come along, and I, and I think you'll see that in a minute. 
So how can you beat uh, how can you beat Wall Street? I've already said the first couple things. I'm taking too long. I want to show you how. You, I think the most interesting thing I could do is to show you quickly what I've learned, you know, in these 30 years of studying the stock market. And then I can show you more examples if you want, or you can go to the website and see examples. But I'm going to show you what probably only 10% of 10% of what people that work on Wall Street know. They don't know it because they don't have to know it. They just trade on trade on tips. I'm telling you. A lot of them are not probably half as smart as you, but they're good old boys, you know, in, in, in the uh, Long yeah. Island world. So you have, a, you have an advantage if you're hungry and outside, because you can get at the truth, I think. So anyway, uh, the first thing is we want to try to learn how to spot tops. It's relatively easy. That's what's so interesting. But they don't tell you this on, on any place I know on television, and they're not going to find it in a history book or an economics book or or probably in an MBA study. They don't teach you these things. But this is what works. And I'm going to show you something. And, and this is not, these numbers, actually, you could get, put them in a computer yourself if you want to, or you could find a cheap little program. Some places will do ours. Our programs I'll sell to any of you for half price, because you're students. But uh, I want you to see a couple things that you could uh, follow to know when a top is taking place. Because it's coming, baby, and it's going to, it could be a big one. And you want to try to figure out what you're going to do about it. Well, I looked at, you know, I put in all this data. Yeah, go ahead. Do you mean top for individual stocks or for indices? Well, they often come together. If we're, if we're talking about uh, major tops, and that's what I'm talking about, it's very rare for an individual stock to escape that. Uh, if you, you know, not many things went up in between 2007 and 2008 and 2009. Some did for a while. Apple went up. Briefly, you know, for three or four months, but then it fell at, uh, later in uh, 2008, along with everything else. So, for all practical purposes, I'm talking about everything, because we're talking about major tops. And if you think your stock can escape it, good luck. You know, most stocks are going to go down in a market that goes down 20 percent, and they're going to go down 40, 60, 80 percent. If you if you tried to duck the the bear market of 72, 73, for example. You'd find uh, that that stocks that you thought were great, that were in the nifty 50, that were most favored in 1972, were down 80% by the time the bear market ended in December of, of 1974. So I think it's better to assume that most stocks are going to go down. Now, there are some exceptions. Gold doesn't always go down. You know, that's an exception. Gold tends to be counter-cyclical. Sometimes uh, crude oil doesn't. Um, Commodities sometimes go different, go differently than stock prices. So there are exceptions, but they're, but for the, and it's also true globally. You know, if you go to my website, tigersoft.com, you'll see that because of how well the general market in the United States affects the whole world, I put together something in Russian, in, in uh, Portuguese, and Spanish, Italian, and French, and German. You know, saying, Kaufen Sie Kiger Software. You know, whatever in German, and you know, Bapu Tiger Software, Baruski, all these things in other languages using a translator. And it was neat to do it. Yeah, it gave me the feeling like I'd speak more, more than one language. But I did it because Peerless, which is our program for market timing, works in all these other all these other languages. I mean, all these other places. You can't escape it. And now what's happening is the United States is trying to pull the rug on on the on, on the Russian uh, stock market, right? That's one way to retaliate for what they think is uh, going on in Ukraine. Now, let's talk about market timing. The granddaddy of all tops was this one. Let me see. I guess I can point. You can see them. You can see a mouse here somewhere pointing, right? Yep. This was the ultimate top. You know, this was the ultimate of ultimate tops. So this, if you had sold here, <laughs> you had bragging rights for three decades, because the market didn't recover back above this until the mid-1950s. Now, how could you have seen that this was a market top? Well, you could have looked around and you could have said, well, too many cab drivers are recommending stocks to, you know, to Joseph Kennedy or people like that. You've heard that story. But instead, look at, at certain characteristics here on this screen. Now, what, I, what I'm displaying here is the Dow Jones average for about a year, or from year to year. And here it goes up from 300 to 380, and then it starts to go down here, recovers a little bit, and then goes straight down for two and a half more years. So this was obviously a major top. No top is more significant than this, and we can learn more from this uh, particular top because it's a 
It's an ideal type, right? It's a perfect example of what, we, what, we're, what we're interested in. Well, you can probably see this later on, and I'll try to show it later, but you can, you can see that the stock market is, is in many cases following a, a, a path, and that path is defined by uh, a midpoint, which is a 21-day moving average, and, a, and an upper band and a lower band, which can change over time if you, if you, uh, if you model it and, and uh, try to make it two standard deviations away from the midpoint. But the main point is you, you can build a path pretty easily using a 21-day moving average. Why 21 days? Because that's the number of trading days in a typical uh, calendar month, and that smooths the data. I learned in Olympia, doing, working for the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, that there's, and doing budget estimates, that there's a lot of seasonality in everything. So we want to try to smooth the data so that we're not in, in producing a moving average that, that lets you see a longer-term trend or smooths that trend so you can see, it, uh, see the momentum. Uh, I learned that uh, there are cycles and we want to try to smooth the data, and I use 21 because there are cycles in the stock market. So anyway, we use a 21-day moving average, and then we use a band that's a, a, about two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below. Uh, that was The bands I use here don't fit as well as they did when I did the testing back in 1981-82, but they still pr work pretty well. When you get to the upper band, the point is the market is generally reaching the top of the top of where it would go short term, and it's reaching uh, uh, the ditch, and it better turn back away from the ditch, in effect. That's the path. So we know we're reaching what's called overbought territory when we reach the top of the band. If also you see what I call non-confirmations or negative non-confirmations, then it's really important. Now, the, there are three or four really key indicators of internal strength in my world. And so I look at what's called the advanced decline line. And that's something that, that, that is the single most important technical indicator about the stock market. And isn't infallible. I mean, there are some tops that occur with the advanced decline line uh, going up even, and matching what the, the Dow is doing. But about 80% of the tops in the stock market that produce declines of 15% or more, and it's probably a lower percentage, could be, I mean, in terms of the percentage declines, uh, certainly of the bigger declines, 80% of them occur because there's something called an, an advanced decline line, which you could follow if you got Investors Daily, or you could, you could probably look on the Internet and find a copy of, fails to confirm as, it, as the Dow reaches the upper band. Now, this is the advanced decline line. What's that based on? And again, let me say that the, the, the salient point here. 80% of the time, a major top doesn't occur until you've got a failure by the advanced decline line to confirm a new high at the upper band or near it. So what's the advanced decline line based on? How does it, how does it turn out it works? Well, it's very simple. You can put it in the spreadsheet. Henry can teach you how to do that, right? Uh, it's the number of stocks up on the New York minus the number of stocks down on the New York added to a previous sum of those numbers. So if you were doing in Visual Basic, how would you do it? Uh, if, if AD is, advanced, is the, what I'm graphing here, and I represents the day that, that we're graphing, and all you're doing is in, in Visual Basic, and I hope Visual Net, because I'm going to have to convert the programs to Visual Net, is equal to AD, I, uh, this is I, minus 1, plus AD uh, I, I should get it right or my back is all crooked, but AD minus AD, I'm sorry, minus uh, it to give you better DE no. I. Better contrast, a better pen. Well, anyway, I, uh, yeah, I'm going to write more stuff up there, so we'll do it. But it's pretty simple. So if you want to compute the advanced decline line, all you're doing is taking the, the difference each day, which is AD sub I minus DE sub I, and adding it to the, the, the cumulative amount that you're doing. So with the computer, it's very simple. That's the, that's the formula. You can use a do loop, or you can use a Fortran of four statement, and, I, and probably ways I can't imagine. 
This was done by me in Visual Basic yeah. with numbers that uh, that we believe are reliable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some of them were gotten by hand. Some of them were gotten. Yeah. The data for before 1950s, uh, 1965 is is more questionable, but it's the best we have. And. and and it proves the point. So if it, it maybe it's wrong by a little bit, but even if we're wrong by a little bit, it would probably still show the same thing. And and where did you get your data? Uh, is that uh, well? That uh, or, or? I have a friend in Connecticut who won't let me tell you uh, in the period before 1965, and he won't tell me. But he's a he manages a lot of money, and so I and I, I think it matches pretty well with what you would expect based on the Dow. It's if I could find a source for it independently, I would like to get it. The data since 1965 is probably available in certain places, but it comes with our programs. So if should you want to use the programs and, and uh, see everything since 1965, and this is just an example. I'm going to show you uh, things that more well, recent I cases know. of TOPS. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I've read like Rakoff and Rogoff. And yeah. Go ahead. They have, you know, they have stock data, and you have stock data, and it must be available. I mean, where is... Well, it is, and it is. You can get it, uh, but you have to pay for it. Uh, there are companies on the internet that will sell you data. I don't think they're going to tell you. I haven't seen any source of the advanced decline data uh, before 1965. That Barron's didn't publish it. See, Barron's is the source of all this information. Barron's is a financial publication. They, they just don't have it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of what what you did here. I mean, you, yeah. you so you wrote, you got your stock data, your historical data. Right, and you wrote visual basic programs to do the graphing and to put graphing. signals on the screen when certain events occur, and, uh, yeah, and yeah. put these and put these internal strength indicators on, like you see. Yeah, and um, and then so then you, you got the VB, the VB program to deliver a graph, and what we're looking at now is you exported that graph to your website, right? Uh, yeah, I just took a picture of the, uh, the, the it's a JPEG file or something like that, and, right. I, and I put it on the website yeah. that I that I built for you. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. I did this with uh, with Basic before there was Visual Basic, so I did this. You know, I figured these things out yeah. um, based upon my study of 19, the 1970 to 1981 period. See, it taught me the same thing. I, I'm just showing you an example of the most of the most extreme case. Uh, nobody had done this before. You're going to enter if you enter a field that nobody's studied before. Who knows? You know, what makes a cat smile? I mean, that wh whatever, whatever it is you're interested in. Bill, quick question. You get you're going to study roughly, things. And learn rough, roughly, how many statements of this nature have you written? Just a rough number to create your product. Is it like? A well, I didn't bring the, uh, the source code. You could look at it the length. Yeah, it's yeah. long. Just rough, roughly. How you many? wouldn't. You know, to do a simple thing it, <laughs> with computers, it takes a lot of statements, right? Just to produce a graph, right? Forget the signals or anything else. You have to you have to line up the highs and lows for the period. You've got to communicate that information to the computer, and you've got to understand uh, how you put the, the you know the line command that's used, and how you uh, uh, you make it work with Visual Basic, which actually, but this number is low and this number is high, right? Yeah. So you've got to invert what you might think. So that's not. That's, but you can once you figure it out. The good thing is you'll never have to do it again. That's the beauty of programming, right? Haven't you all discovered that? Once you, you know, you've got a problem to solve, right? You scratch your brain, get bald, whatever. You, you scratch your head. You, you finally, finally, you figure it out. If you don't lose your source code, and I've done that, you won't have any problems because it, it's always going to work. Yeah, but we then we just give them other problems. Yeah, well, there's always some other problem. That's right. Then you got to put the signals yeah, right. on the screen. Well, let me go ahead, because I want to show you that, that there's some more truths here. This information, the advanced decline line, is the, is, is the single most important technical indicator you can look at. Not going to work all the time, but it's going to work all but, in all but a few cases. And I'm going to tell you, talk to you about the other cases. So you want to try to recognize tops. Do a search for New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line, and you're going to be able to probably get charts every day and not pay for them. That's what I would do. What you want to watch for, and I'm going to show you so many examples, it's going to knock your socks off, as they say. You're going to find lots of examples of this. That's what we have to worry about. The advanced decline line right now is not not confirming. So there's hope, right? It could be one of the exceptions, it's true. But right now, the advanced decline line is very strong. 
and that's good. Go ahead. So what exactly are we looking at with the events of the combined line and the, the Dow Jones there? Well, you're trying to, uh, to spot tops, and the way I, I would want you to look at them is first, what's the direction of the Dow, which is up, going up there for, up until the top, right? And what's the direction of that blue line, which is this advanced decline line? This is the advanced decline line. It's going down. That's called a divergence. Divergences set up tops. Typically, tops occur about after four to six or seven months of divergence. Well, we haven't had a divergence yet, so, so maybe we're six, at least four to six months away. Maybe, maybe not, right? But maybe it'll happen next week. I think what the Dow Jones is in average or total chip size. Right. And the advanced decline line is a ratio right. of the number of stocks that have gone up versus the number of stocks that have gone down. Right. Okay. I mean So yeah, look at it cynically. Now here you know maybe it'll help you if you look at it cynically. Why does this work? Well I got some other reasons besides the cynical reason, but one way is it's manipulation. Right? They're trying to fool you. Hey the Dow is going up, everything is great. Let's snooker the little guy. Get him to buy some stocks, right? Hey, the Dow Jones made some air, made some new highs. It's got to be a good market. Mildred, let's go buy some stocks, right? <laughs> well, it doesn't necessarily work that way, as, as you're seeing here, and as you're going to see in probably 15 other cases or more of the major tops since 1929. Now, that's the cynical view. It also doesn't work. Go ahead. So, if, so theoretically, just the idea is that the advanced decline line should, and, this, and the actual pricing of stocks should normally be following each other if there was no manipulation. Right. That's part of it, yes. Then you get then there's something to worry. There's something wrong. You know, there's a there's a, a foul odor coming from that house, right? Something something going on. Well, what is what makes the advanced decline line go up is uh, a market that is what I call strong. It's it's got breadth. It could be a real economy, right? Getting going, doing really well. Well, maybe the economy is getting better. Maybe they're, you know, all all boats are are are, are being lifted by this tide of, of a better economy. Could be that. But probably a better answer is the New York Stock Exchange is uh, loaded up with dividend-paying stocks. Right? These are stocks that, uh, that that pay dividends, and if you lower interest rates or keep interest rates low, or if you promise for years and years there's going to be low interest rates, as the Fed chairwoman now is, is suggesting, although not quite that strongly, but pretty close, then then bonds, funds are going to go up, bonds are going to go up, preferred stocks are going to go up, and XYZ stock that pays 3% a year is going to look pretty good. Couple of questions first, because I don't have any economics background. This is all new to me. Good. Um, you will. You don't have anything to learn. <laughs> uh, so, would you say that the advanced decline line is a uh, a net gain or loss? Yes. In the, in the market, that's what it. It's a cumulative line okay. derived from this formula, where you have you start off with you know A D, and I put sub I because that's the current day, and it equals the previous accumulation, previous day's accumulation whatever that was, plus advances minus declines for that current day. And there are advanced decline lines for every stock exchange, not just the NYSE? Yeah, there are. The they're not easily available. Also. We, I compute them for industry groups, and it's very helpful. Okay. But uh, but for our purposes, you know, the first thing to do is be, be safe about the market. So you want to try to do what I'm saying, uh, and the advanced decline lines can help you a lot. Okay. So that, keep that in mind. And you can do your own studies of the advanced, advanced decline I confirm it. I want to show you some things that I think will confirm it. If you go to this website, you know, you go to tigersoft.com and see all the good things I've written, and, you, and many of them will be suggested, a lot more than I can say here. But if you go to tigersoft.com forward slash intro, capital I, intro, you'll see what I don't have time probably to show today. Now, let me also tell you that there's some other things to look for. We, we build an oscillator. What's an oscillator? It goes up and down around zero. Uh, based on this advanced decline line, uh, and that's the 21-day moving average of advances minus declines. Now, how would you figure out the, the advanced decline line uh, moving average for 21 days? you, you got to think about that or buy my software because it's not probably any, anywhere else. But it has the neat property of doing this. 
this is what I like about it, it's visual. My mother was an artist, I guess. So we, the Dow goes to the upper band, and this indicator is negative. That's called a negative non-confirmation. That produces in our programs called, something called an S9. Think of strychnine. We had a boxer that was uh, twice poisoned with strychnine when I was a kid, and the second time he killed a dog. Uh, so I thought of strychnine as something bad. S9 is a bad signal to see. We get S9s when the Dow hits the upper band, and this indicator, the P indicator, is in negative territory. And the S9 is probably the, the most powerful of all the cell signals. So visually, we can see these, uh, uh, these if you could, there's a whole bunch of cell signals here, that's why you can't make it out. But there, an S9 occurs at the, as you hit the upper band, and, the negative, and this indicator is negative. Now, the third indicator, this is uh, another thing I could give you a lesson from. The accumulation index. Uh, this is a, an indicator which is proprietary. I, I could give you a rough idea about it, but I don't want to tell you what it's actually based on. But it's, a, it's something I developed back in 19, uh, 80, 1981. I think it's interesting to know that even though I invented it, actually I invented it in the 70s, at first I didn't know what I was dealing with because when I looked at, the, at stocks in the 1970s, this was 1972 with the access to an IBM 360, uh, an early IBM 360, and then I used a little Bomar calculator to try to produce the results by hand, I found that, uh, gee, there's, all these numbers are negative. How can, I, must, I must have made a mathematical error, so I dismissed it. Well, the numbers were all negative in, the 19, in 1972 and 73 because the bear market was about to start. But this is a, a measure, in effect, of distribution and accumulation. If the market goes up and this indicator is in negative territory, it means there's a lot of distribution taking place. It means that the stock or the index is closing near the lows on high volume for the day. doesn't mean it's going to collapse immediately, but why is it closing at the lows for the day? Or if it goes up and it closes at the high for the day, that tends to be more positive. So an I built an indicator like this. First I was thrown off by it, but then as I started testing it uh, with all this back data that I put in, I began to see that it was worthwhile. And I walked into an office in Albuquerque and I made a presentation and I had ranked stocks on this base and the guy said, well, this is a guy at Mensa, right? I learned from all the smart people around me. I believe me, this head doesn't have half the brains of a lot of smart people to do. And he said, well, why don't you make this into an oscillator? So I did and he was absolutely right. Now the moral for you is not only to listen to the smart people if they make suggestions, because they're kind of to do that, but be careful who your friends are when you give them valuable information. Because I had a customer who, uh, you just can't imagine how schnookerish people are, to use that word, that's a polite word in this case. But he gave me a couple clients, so I appreciate that. But then he took my idea and he published it as his own. It wasn't his idea. He just took it from me and he published it as his own. He put a mention of, of my company, Type of Software, in one sentence in this long article about the, about the, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the indicator. So, you get, you're probably all capable of really good ideas. Be careful how you release them. In that vein, another story. When I first started off, you know, I was babe in the woods. Hey, we sell the software, and hey, I grew up in the Midwest. People are honorable, right? They don't cheat and steal. Well, this guy uh, bought my package, had all the indicators we talked about, and uh, more, and he liked it a lot. But he returned it. How do I know he liked it? Because he put his own software out in competition and my customers called me and said, hey, that's your software, right? So you got to be really careful. So what I do when I get an order, now maybe if we get a million orders, I can't do this. I always find out who the person is who's buying the software. And if I find out he's, in a, he's clearly in a position to disseminate the information to the big people on Wall Street or to himself to, uh, to, through his own company, then I don't want to sell it. So I don't know what you're going to make or if you get into this yourself, but be careful who your friends are. Now you get lots of good ideas from people, so there's a, you have to use some you know, street smarts to not give the information away unnecessarily. But that would be a lesson I would not... Another lesson, now, since we're talking about lessons, I promised myself I would tell you this. <coughs> don't go up to San Francisco carrying a big Apple II Plus and go in the financial district with both hands holding the computer. Why? You get your picket. You get your pocket picked. You lose seven hundred dollars. I did this in 1982 or 83, right? So, 
Anyway, it's, or put in a money belt. I don't know. But figure out something. You know, get somebody to walk along with you and constantly tap your wallet and see if it's there. Okay, now I want to go uh, through this a little bit. So we got, we want to take a look quickly at these three indicators and uh, show you that this is not happenstance. So I'm, if you go scroll down a little further, you're going to see this is the logo I had in 1981. Here's the Mission Bay roller coaster, a tiger menacing a bull and a bear. I thought that was nice. Uh, you can, uh, this is, what are these? These are examples of this. Yeah, so, but, okay, uh, 1978. Here you, you can see you go up, you hit the upper band, and the, this indicator, the P indicator, is negative. So is the accumulation index. That's a negative non-confirmation. That's definitely going to bring sales. And what does the market do? What goes down really quickly? And what happens if in the reverse, right? Could you get buy signals the opposite way? You can. It doesn't happen as often, but what if the Dow goes down and you start seeing these indicators turn positive? Then you get a B9, which is very benign, right? That's only appropriate. So we can see that. This is from 1978, the bottom in 1978. So you can use the same thing in reverse. Um, now, there are some exceptions. Now, probably four cases out of 21, or maybe five cases out of 21 are the exceptions. Now, here's something you can do, too. because This is a really uh, easy thing to spot if you know what to look for, and it has a great deal of significance. Yep. You mentioned close. You would stop me at this point? <laughs> You know, I made a presentation to all these fun men. I got to tell you, it's a funny story. I thought I thought it was funny. Some of them laughed, some of them didn't. But I had had 150 high-powered people in front of me at an audience back in, in the 90s, and I was about ready to tell them. And I said, "Well, now here's the secret of the S9." And then I said, "Oh, oh, right, Fred Fox." I write one. Oh, oh, oh. You know, sort of like this, so they would never get to know. And I thought, and then I said, "Isn't that funny?" And they, some of them laughed, some of them didn't. I guess the older people didn't laugh. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned things like closing prices, right? So does, do, does after-hours trading throw a wrench into that? Yeah, we don't use them. And they, I thought they would mess things up, but in fact, there's ways to incorporate that understanding, that what they do into the understanding. So give me a chance, we'll get to that. Now, what you want to think about besides the advanced decline line is a price pattern. All the books talk about head and shoulders. So you can Google head and shoulders till the cows come home and read all you want to about it. This is a basic head and shoulder pattern. A left shoulder, a head, and a right shoulder. They aren't always this symmetrical. Sometimes they're shorter term, like here's a little head, I mean here's a little shoulder, here's another head, and there's a smaller, a bigger head than the shoulder, and then there's a, a, a right shoulder that's lower. Well that still counts and it's still a warning sign. But what happens is if you get a pattern that looks as classic as this and then you get a breakdown, maybe there'll be one last pullback, but that's very bearish. A discovery that nobody on the planet knows except you and people that have subscribed to my services. This head and shoulder pattern it's, it is amazing, because if you look back, you'll see that's the way the stock market reacts to unexpected events, either happening right away or that, that, that are about to happen. It happened before Pearl Harbor was bomb, bombed, right? Kind of interesting, right? Why would this pattern develop before Pearl Harbor? It happened um, uh, it, before the Cuban Missile Crisis. It happened before 9-11. Uh, it happened before the Eisenhower had his heart attack, or no, I guess simultaneous with the heart attack. It happened before John Kennedy was killed. Scary thought. Head and shoulder patterns uh, are, are the way the market reacts to very unexpected news that it either wasn't factoring in quickly enough or that it better get going. This was, these were labor troubles that were producing the, uh, this head and shoulder pattern. Suddenly the whole West Coast was going to go on strike because of the longshoremen. Right? So this was back in 1946 as the, as the World War II ended. Head and shoulder patterns uh, also occurred when suddenly North Korea attacked South Korea in 1950. And there's probably some, lots of others like, I, oh, when Nixon introduced uh, a new economic policy that, caused, that, that brought in price controls, at least business was worried that they would, and that took the, the U.S. Off the, goal, off the gold standard, that was a very sudden big change. That was in 1971. You'll see a head and shoulder pattern there. So, you look up head and shoulder patterns, this is what they look like, you'll see lots of examples, and you can watch for them, because if they develop, they're almost self-fulfilling, because they're well known on Wall Street, and they will be followed by Wall Street. Now maybe there's something in, your, in, in what you're interested in that also can be represented pictorially,
But this is one of the menacing forms, and to some extent it's self-fulfilling. If enough people believe it, it's going to happen, right? But why would it happen before Kennedy was assassinated? Why would it happen before 9-11? Pretty scary stuff. So that's, that's part of the story. Now I'm going to probably have to skip ahead because I'm going I'm to make sure we talk about other things. You can see a lot more about negative non-confirmations uh, on that, that page if you go to it. Now, let's talk about stocks. And then there's, there's more to it than, I'm talk, than I've said, so you have to go there to see the rest. But the first thing you want to do with stocks is to uh, work with a trend. And that's true in, in uh, probably in most everything. Why fight the trend? Think about it. If you could, if, you know, when you're looking for a job, um, why find a job with with Radio Shack, you know, or J.C. Penney? They may not be in business, right? Why would you want to do that? At the same time, if you're looking to make money in the stock market, don't try to call the bottom. If you try, if you try to call the bottom with Radio Shack or J.C. Penney, you may luck out. Maybe you'll be really successful, but at least wait for the for the some sign that, that that trend is coming to an end. So how do you figure out a trend? Well, again, you can do it uh, in ways that probably I'm, that I've suggested a little bit. You can watch a 21-day moving average, but what we watch primarily is a 65-day moving average. A 65-day moving average is, is often used as a way to keep track of quarterly cycles, because a lot of businesses are, you know. Uh, uh, use uh, quarterly uh, measures too of strength in the stock market, especially. So we watch, want to watch the direction of, of a 65-day moving average. So you would just put in, you know, it's a, it's a variation on that. If we call this uh, MA65, you know, then you're going to take. Actually, this is a little more complicated. I better not do this because that's going to take up about two, two or three minutes. But it'd be a challenge. See if you can produce a 65-day moving average or a 21-day moving average, you know, in some class or for your own amusement. You know, that's a, that's a, that's what I've had to do. So you want to be able to uh, produce. A, what you have to do is you have to produce a, a sum first of, for 65 days, and then you've got to divide it by 65 in effect. So that's the way you do it. We're also looking at internal strength measures. So we have to look for uh, these indicators of internal strength to to support the idea that there's been a trend change. Right, so you can see it goes. This goes positive and it turns negative. What is this we're looking at? Let's see. Uh, this is oil prices in 1968 and 19 uh, and 2008. So they went up and then they went down. So you want to, if you had bought up here or bought over here and didn't sell when they broke down, you'd be you'd be in trouble. So the trend is your friend, and that's the that's the basic idea here. Let me skip ahead. If the trend is our friend then we want to find the things that are going to trend for a long time and trend up big time, right? You want to buy something, you want to find, a, let's say we want to buy something in a trend, well, we want to find something that's going to go up a lot. And here's where the insider trading comes in, because insiders will often tip you, uh, tip off where stock is going to go. I just put this in as an example, but it's, it really worked out well. Uh, this is a, and a lot of biotech companies uh, uh, show these things. This, by in my belief, shows insider buying. That's the accumulation index going very positive, and then the stock starts going up. It was, it was going up, but not very much before all this insider buying and this, this so-called breakout. What was, what was going on was the doctors were, were hearing how good, how effective, efficacious, uh, the, drugs, the drug was that Pharmacet was making uh, for hepatitis. And that's a major scourge. I mean, a lot of, you know, we know people that were killed, you know, died from that, and you probably know people maybe too. So, you know, God bless the, uh, the inventors of anything that would help remedy that. Well, the, doc the doctors found out how effective the drug was before the, the, the investors did, and they start buying it. And they continue to buy it as it start going up. Now, what has happened, what happened at the end of this chart is the company was bought out by a stock that then has gone up another 100% since called uh, Giddin, Guidin. So if you are interested in, you know, being on the cusp, you know, staying abreast of, of news that might make a difference, then you want to look for these bulges of accumulation in a field that you're interested in. Uh, and biotech is a perfect example. And maybe looking at, uh, if you're, you have a friend or maybe you get sick from something, heaven forbid, you know, you want to see where the breakthroughs are taking place. Maybe somebody's making a breakthrough in some uh, some field that you're in. 
So we want to look for bulges of accumulation. We want to look for gaps up. That's, that's a good sign. And then the uptrend. Now, in fact, if you have this big bulge of accumulation, it's saying that insiders expect big things sometime in the future. They would not buy be buying like this for a small gain. They didn't buy this just to make 10 or 15%. When you look at enough stocks, you can see that this is a big bulge of accumulation and it lasted a long time. So they knew something really good was about to happen. Yeah. Where do you get insider trading data? Like well, yeah, that's, I'm glad you asked that because I'm, I'm not giving you the answer yet that you need. Uh, inside information is available on Yahoo. Insider trading information is available on Yahoo. If you typed in XYZ stock, uh, they have, we could actually do it, but if you play with it, you can, you can look at uh, what's called, uh, um, I think it's insider transactions, yeah. and you actually can see it. But there's a problem with insider trading uh, as, as it's officially dealt with. It doesn't begin to get at doctors, for example, who are hearing about the, the breakthrough that's taking place in a field that they maybe they're offering uh, clinical trials for, right? Hey, you may have an uncle who works for Qualcomm and Qualcomm suddenly does something ingenious, right? And you get your uncle to talk, which he probably might or might not want to do, but let's say he talks to you, you're not an insider. It's very hard to get you for you to be tracked down. Isn't that interesting? The SEC may or not, may not bother you. They tend to only work on cases that are slam dunk, simple. They only tend to only work on cases involving uh, people that work for the company. So we're picking up on a much on insider trading in I think a more realistic way, and all the people that might um, act on it, stockbrokers, you know, hear about. Uh, insiders all the time. That's what they. That's what they make their money. Some big, some guy on the inside probably is going to mention something to his broker, or else he's going to just start buying in a strange, unusual way. Huh? Why would he buy ten thousand shares or twenty thousand shares suddenly for this stock, and then put another order in, and then more orders come in? You scratch your bald head and you begin to think maybe, you know, there's something going on here. So you start doing some research, and, and then maybe you can get get to it. A lot of times you can't. But this is buying on the rumor. This is buying on the insider information. The bigger the bulge, the more likely it's, it's going to go up a long ways and for a long time. Typically, and I did a lot of testing of this, bulges like this uh, don't bring a top for at least uh, 12 months. And that's very significant. So if you saw a bulge like this and the stock starts going up, it may be 12 months before the stock plays itself out. So that's really important. So you look for bulges and, uh, and to confirm that the trend is for real. Now, something else you can do that I may not have time to say, but you can watch for pullbacks to this 65-day uh, moving average. That's this purple line. And you can watch for the, uh, the, the blue line to hook back up. That's our measure of, of professional buying and selling. Let's, maybe I should talk about that. Uh, now, Let's just talk about that a little bit, because that's going to get that's yet another idea. Now, this didn't come from anybody but the you know observation and thinking about these things. So this was original, and what I'm going to show you now. Let's do. It's called uh, professional buying and selling. Let's give you an example. Oh, that's not it. Maybe I've got. I hope I've got uh, hooked wrong. Yeah, the last one is number five. That's what you want to go to, and. Let's come down a little further. I'm going to show you something. We have uh, something called opening power, and we have something called closing power. Opening power tells you what's happening with a stock from last night's close to the next day's opening. What would cause a stock to go up at the opening from a previously low closing? Well, it's probably because either there's news in Europe or Japan, someplace overseas, or it's because, you know, the public is in the stock. If you think back, if you ever bought a stock, you probably said just buy it. And if you said it after after the market closes, he's going to put the order in for the next day's opening. That's the simplest thing to do for a stockbroker, not, not at a price, just put it in at the opening. It is my belief, and there's a lot of evidence to support it, that we can separate out public from private buying. Pro I'm sorry, public buying buying being the less professional, the more emotional, less informed buying, 
from the from the professional mind, which presumably is uh, more knowledgeable, maybe more manipulative, manipulative and more controlling, by looking at opening power and closing power. One measures how much change there is overnight, and one measures how much change there is in price from the opening to the close. Now, that's, nobody else knows that. This is what I've offered the world. And it works. It works. Because you can use this to time your entrances, entrances, and entrances in a stock when, when there's a dip, or when there's been a bulge of, of insider buying, right? Sometimes the insiders buy too quickly, and then the stock will, eventually will start pulling back. That's when you watch these, the professionals. When they start buying, there's a hook back up, and things get, get very interesting. So we look for divergences, and sometimes you can see big differences between the slopes of what's happening and, and because of public buying and what's happening based on professional buying. Look at, at, uh, at this case. Now, what, what, when, when is this? Let's see. This was in, uh, oh, this was in, in at the bottom of Amazon. Okay, now what, how could you have bought Amazon? Let's say you all like Amazon because you know that people are buying books online, right? Cheaper to buy books online than, than anyplace else. Well, this is Amazon's chart. And uh, this, is the, this is the last four months or so of the decline in, in 2008, 2009. For a while, both lines are going down. I call that the both down condition. And that's tends to be, that tends to mean that prices are going to go down most severely. That means that it opens lower and it closes lower than that. But what happens at the bottom, these people that are professionals, they start putting bushel baskets under the stock, and they start collecting it, and they start causing the stock to not uh, close any lower than the opening. So look, what, look at the difference. The green line is going down, and this last leg down, and the blue line is going up. Well, that's very common at, at a major bottom, and nobody else knows that. I, you can't get that from, I don't think, without knowing the formulas or, and using our software, but it should suggest to you that there's a big difference between what the public does and what uh, professionals are doing. And if we watch closely, we can see, you know, especially with our indicators, we can watch and see when the professionals are coming back in the stock. Then it becomes really easy to predict a rally. So that's, that's, the, la that's the, uh, the, I think, the, almost the last point. Um, I want to show you how you can spot stocks to go down because we may get into another uh, bear market that's very long, and this is the last thing I'll show you. If, you. if you look at our accumulation index, it turns red, and it'll turn red for a very long time. And it, the longer it turns red, the more awful the stock goes down. You can't believe how, how uh, I don't think without doing a lot of study, which is what I do, how without conscience, I, I, only way I can say it, some of the people are that are in charge of companies and how they will sell out their shares even though they're not supposed to before the stock, uh, before the news of the stock comes out that will cause the stock to go down. So um, you, maybe you remember uh, Washington Mutual. But what I want you to see is if we got into another bear market, you would probably see some of the conditions I'm going to show you. Uh, because that's what happened in 2008 and 2009, or even 2007. Uh, Washington Mutual went bankrupt. This is the company that uh, was, was uh, I don't think it was bought out. I think it, maybe Chase, Chase took it over, but after, after the company went bankrupt. The head of the company, a guy named Killington, I looked up his political affiliation. He gave Democrats money. He gave Republicans money. Right? He, wanted, he, wanted, he wanted somebody to talk to, no matter who was in power. He sold his stock at 54, you know, 16 months before the stock went bankrupt. He knew, you probably all know about the crash that happened back then and, and some of the conditions that led to it, but he knew that he was using too much leverage. He knew that these, that too many uh, liar's loans were made to his customers and that there's no way that these customers would be able to survive a big decline and that would be very bad for Washington Mutual. He knew it. Uh, so did Rubin, who was uh, Clinton's uh, Treasury Secretary. He did the same thing with Citibank. So we can often see patterns of insider selling in, from high, in, you know, people that are way up there. And, and they're listed in Yahoo. Back then, that you could look them up uh, on Yahoo and see that they were actually doing the selling. But why is it they sold so many shares 
right at the top because they knew that bad things were going to happen. Well, we pick up on that uh, because this indicator turns red and it doesn't turn positive very much the whole way down. And when that happens, you get big declines. Uh, two years ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, Glenn Beck and some of his buddies, uh, uh, Sean Hannity, uh, were recommending everybody go out and buy silver. You, maybe you know somebody who went out and bought silver or gold because the world's going to fall apart and the dollar's going to collapse. Well, uh, it ain't necessarily so. Uh, if you looked at gold or silver or silver stocks back at you know 2010 or 2011 or 2012, you start seeing all this red. Well, why would there be so much insider selling on strength if it was such a good deal? It wasn't. What you also saw, was, I don't think I can show the pattern here, but you could find it on the internet pretty easily, is you find not just a lot of red, but you see this thing I was talking about with, uh, here, this, this uh, insider professional, uh, no, nope, wrong one again. This one. What you see, what, what I saw in 2007, even before the market went down until 2000, or March 2009, what you see is that this blue line was going down right away, make, starting to make 12 month lows before the stock went, uh, made, made 12 months lows itself. So you start seeing closing power new lows as well as the, this indicator turns red. And that's your clue that the top is going down. Now, when you put all this together, what you do is you, you run Tiger software, and the computer will produce a current chart of the Dow. This is the current chart of the Dow. We should look at the advanced decline line, and we'll look at it like this. You can see the advanced decline line has is, is been confirming the highs, right? So if we're going to get a top, it isn't going to be in the orthodox way of using an advanced decline line. Uh, there's not going to be an advanced decline line confirmation. That should give us a little confidence that the Fed is going to continue low rates, and that could cause um, maybe one more speculative surge. could be a gigantic one. You know, what better way to ensure that everybody who's ever going to be a buyer comes in than if the stock market or the NASDAQ and low-price stocks go up for 30 days in a row or something like that? Something colossal. See, that's what happened before the top in, in 2000. Think about it. Think, you know, this is uh, psychology. We can put signals on the screen easily enough. And if you, if you uh, work with the, the, the data, you're allowed to make changes. So that when you learn something new, you, you put new signals in, and that's a, that was not a signal we got real time. But what it was based on was something that was consistent with what I've, what I've been telling you. If you put the P indicator on the screen, you can see the Dow falls actually below the lower band, and the P indicator is almost positive. So when I did some back testing, I found that that, that was actually a, um, what should have been a good buy signal. So we so that's been dummied in or or made part of the of the new software. So the programs do uh, learn over time, but they but they do learn. They're not stubborn. They try to learn something that that is test very well over a long period of time. Now, how do you find stocks? That's the neat part. We have a we have a power ranker. So the program that, uh, that that I built is to try to make it really simple. There are lots of ways to, to find stocks. People don't all do what I'm saying, but here's what we, we here's what I preach. We go to our our I'm not going to show you the the data page, but we go to the data page and we download a group of stocks called MaxCP. MaxCP are the stocks each day that are making closing power new highs. Well, that's a good thing. Closing power new highs would mean that the professionals are buying the stock. I like the fact that professionals are buying the stock, right? They, they're short term, but they're, they usually have pretty good information. Now, what if I could find not just the stocks that professionals are buying, but insiders are heavily buying? I'd be, I'd be home free, right? So we do that. We, we go to MaxCP, we run the ranking program, which may or may not run right now or not fast, but it runs okay. Incidentally, this is with a $125 laptop that Microsoft wants me to give up and buy a $550 or $750 Windows 8 or Windows 9 machine. And I don't know, maybe some of you know how long the machines will, uh, will still work without Microsoft support, but I have customers who uh, are quite happy to buy XPs and buy a $125 laptop and, and run the programs like this. 
I am going to have to do the conversion, and I'm interested in having some help. And if some of you know Visual Net, why I'm sure we could work out some sort of a deal. So that might be of interest. So I've run the ranking program. Now, what are the best stocks right now? The computer's got to tell me. The best stocks in terms of closing power new highs and having the uh, accumulation index be very high. Well, what we do is we run the ranking program, and then I go to the Tiger menu. Here's our famous logo in the Mission Bay. I guess it still stands, right? Yes. <laughs> it's been a while since I've gone on a roller coaster there. But anyway, here's the, here's, it, does, it worked the last time I was there. Here's Bullish. Now, this is a stock that's obviously going up a long ways, but every now and then we find one that isn't up that much, and it pulls back. In this case, to that 21 day, to that 65 day moving average, we're looking for that, and then the closing power hooks back up. You see? See what I'm saying is we've got the 65 day moving average. The computer tells me this is a good stock. Well, if we see that it pulls back and then the hook, the hook is turning back up, that's a good buy. That's a good buy. It's also a good buy in another case, and this is something that um, is not well known but should be. Uh, Investors Daily does talk about this a lot. Uh, flat top breakouts. So when you get a stock that has a lot of accumulation and there's a flat top breakout, that means the stock may not pull out, pull back. It may just it may just surge upwards for a while. So you also want to buy stocks that look like this when they make new highs. And anyway, there, there's more of them. But this would be a classic case. Here's a perfect pullback to to the 65 day moving average. You watch for the hook back up. That means that the professionals are no longer selling, and what does the stock do? It goes up a lot. So we like that. I wanted to show you this. You know, this is a, we're, we're living at, how many of you are following? Yeah, go ahead. This is a good time to take a breath, so okay. I can tell you my story. Okay. Go ahead. How much of a factor is the stock price? For example, if it's too low, is there too much of a change percentage-wise? Or if it's too high, is there not enough room for change? You know what I mean? If it's like no, I don't think it matters. I mean, it, it may matter in some ways I'm not, I can't think of right now, but markets change, and sometimes low-price stocks are in. Right now, it's Chinese low-price stocks are definitely in favor. And why is that? Because what? Because people like to speculate in, in China? Maybe because that's the best game in town. I think... And this is my lead in to this, is because we have a very macho contest taking place internationally between Russia and America. Putin takes off his shirt, acts tough, and not to be bested, you know. There's our, our, uh, our uh, Secretary of State saying, in the most hypocritical fashion I can imagine, we don't believe countries should start wars based upon uh, uh, pretexts and lies. Well, I thought that's what America did, you know, in the early 2000s. You know, again, my head is getting balls scratching, but I'm rolling. This is how do you put your put your little symbol up for laughing out loud, rolling on the floor. R O L, right? Whatever. So anyway, it, it's it would it would be funny if it weren't so sad. But this is a macho world. This this is a macho stock. This is world wrestling. So it's appropriate, <laughs> I suppose, that this stock would be uh, would be going going up really well. Here's a little flat top breakout. But look how easy it is to find them. We look for stocks that show immense, not just high, but immense amount of insider buying. The news is out. What's the, that's a good Hank Williams song sometimes you should look it up. But the, the news is out here. They've figured out that they can do away with the middleman. They can get a lot more people to, to buy on Time Warner or wherever they sell the rights now for, for the, all the wrestling uh, championships. And, and you ever watch them? They're colorful, right? Don't they fun? I mean, for 10 minutes? I think so. Hulk Hogan, all that? I guess I'm a macho guy. Whatever. Anyway, they, they figured out a way to sell a lot of uh, subscriptions and do away with the middleman. And, uh, and it looks like it's going to work out. So Time Warner is going to be offering you know, the world wrestling available channel for a small amount. And you won't have to pay the huge amounts that you used to. So the, the, the expectation is going to make a lot of money. Well, somebody knew in advance that all these things were going to take place. Uh, so we're hoping that the world will, will not come to an end, I hope, with, the, uh, with all the macho activity. Uh, if you're interested in that, I have notions about that because I, I looked into that. But. So we got stocks to choose from. 
I don't know why a, a drilling stock would be doing so well. Maybe they found a new way to uh, drill successfully. Maybe they have an interest in, in some uh, new well. But this is unusual behavior for this stock. Often you'll find that, um, now maybe this is over the heads of a lot of you, but maybe not. If you, if you were to run these programs, you would find sometimes certain industries are overpopulating the, this group of stocks, which are I call the bullish max CP stocks. When that happens, it's, it's a, it makes the, uh, the group probably more authentic. This is the only drilling stock, so it's probably not significant. Um, although this is an Arab American, maybe that's another oil stock, so maybe that's interesting. But you can see what's happening here. Lots of accumulation. Here's a flat top base. It's not too far away from the, the 65 day moving average. It looks like maybe it, it, it could start to go up. So the computer finds that automatically. Speaking of, uh, you know, dishes to get away from Time Warner, as we were this morning, well, you can see that Time Warner's not is going to lose some subscribers if it, if it uh, hooks up with, what's the other company, Comcast. And maybe dishes are going to start selling if you're not in a valley. Uh, so that, that's making a suggestion there. And I don't know what this is, but look at, look at how the, the, somebody knew something back here. And there was no pullback so, until way over here. But if you followed it, you see there was the pullback, and then here's the hook back upwards from the pullback. The professionals are manipulating the stock to try to get it to go down, and they did it over here too. They start, they start making it go down so they can put some more in their baskets because then they know it's going to go up eventually. So they want to buy it. They make it go down so, so it's cheap. When they get through with their buying, their short-term buying, then, then it hooks back up and up goes the stock. Same thing works in reverse. There just aren't very many stocks. So we count the number of stocks that are in this group, and then we go to the what I call min CP, and we look at the stocks that look that are likely to go down. And we don't, don't find very many right now, but there's the min C group only has 46 stocks, so that's not very bearish. And there's 212 max CPs, so there's a lot more stocks that look good than bad, that's a good sign for the market. Run the ranking program, which I, I'll do right now. And here you'll you'll see stocks that look ugly. Yeah. So I should say yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the computer program doesn't know about fundamentals, but you know about fundamentals. So what's the relationship between fundamentals and what your what your programs do? Well, the more you know, the better. Uh, I think this is a this is giving you wake up calls to check out stocks, so you can start looking up the fundamentals and find out maybe information that is not publicly known. Uh, or you may find out the information that is not widely publicly known. You may find out um, also quantitative, something that's quantitatively really different. Some, there are, you know, like Crocodile Dundee, right? This is a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> you know, there are bulges and then there are bulges of accumulation. Well, if you see this, some of the big bulges, like you will see on my website or you'll see, see on these pages, these are really significant. They're going to give you uh, uh, something that you should definitely check out. And these stocks don't just double. That's what's amazing if you give them a chance. And you can hold them as long as the, they you know, ride that 65-day moving average up, and they'll give you a lot of times uh, a lot more than just a, a simple double, which is very pleasant. Uh, our tools, though, will tell you when to get out. And one of the ways you'll, you'll recognize it is if they ever, your stocks ever look like these babies, this is the, you go to bearish now. So we're looking at the stocks that don't just have closing power new lows. They also have lots of red distribution. This is what you don't want to see your stocks look like. I don't know what this is, but this stock is, uh, is, is ranked very low and it's below its 65-day moving average and it's showing more and more distribution. Some will look much worse than this. Let's see what we got next. Weight Watchers. Maybe people are finding other ways to lose weight than go to Weight Watchers, but this looks terrible. I would not get a job with Weight Watchers, you know, if you were to go, go up to Carlsbad. Uh, sometimes you'll find ETFs that are counter trend, and that's what this is, so that may be a little more subtle than I want to get into right now. Uh, I don't know what Cliffs National does, but I wouldn't want to go, go to work for them. And if I was looking for a stock to hedge with, here's another thing you can do. You can say, okay, I don't know whether the market's going to go up or down, but you could buy thousand dollars worth of the stock to go up and, and you can sell short a thousand dollars worth of the stock to go down. You can make money conceivably on both ends. So what you do with hedging, 
might take some of these long position, these these recommendations for what's called a long position, a buy position, and and according to how bearish you are, um, sell short something like this. And the theory is that, and it works most of the time. I say most of the time, not not in a, every case, but certainly consistently, and with some extra tools used. You can make money uh, being long and short. If you go to the mytigersoft.com website, you'll see it's actually proposed, and you'll see some examples of it where you make money on both sides. Uh, maybe we'll get time to do that. But uh, let's take another bearish stock. Uh, Lynn Energy looks terrible. Whatever this stock is, it looks terrible. It shows me that energy stocks are not the answers. Some go up, some go down. But this, you could hedge. You could be long Arab American, apparently. That would be looks good. At the same time, go short this. So you would be hedged in, in, in the same industry. This shows a lot of insider selling. The closing power is making a, a, 20, uh, a, a whole year low. That's not good. And it even looks like you could stretch this and say it's a head and shoulder pattern. Let me see if I find any more that would be of interest. There's another oil stock. Uh, Canon, I don't know if that means anything. This. Yeah, these are another another oil stock there. Another oil stock there. That's interesting. So you, there's about four or five oil stocks that don't look too good. This is probably natural gas also, but this looks dreadful, and you want to wait more, more the uh, the recent period here. Now, that's about it. There's a lot more, but that's about it. Let me have a drink of water, and you can ask questions, or and I can show you some programming. Uh, and when you think about programming. When I lived in Albuquerque, um, I tried to get a job, and I thought I was perfectly qualified. Maybe I was too qualified. But the test question was, uh, for somebody who was interested in the stock market, was how do you find the high and the low for a set of data? You know, say you've got 200 days of data, 250 days of data, which is about a year's time. How do you, what's the way you find the high and the low using, using programming? Can you do that? So the first thing you have to do is to, is to have a, a variable, let's, let's say call it max. We're just going to get the highs. So this is REM find highs, right? So you have to have a variable called max high or something like that. And we're going to make that a, a really low number. The reason we make it a low number is because as we go through the data, we want any number higher than this to be saved. But you should be able to do it. If you're, if you're going to learn programming, you should be able to find the high for the data. And if you can't, uh, you might get asked that in, I mean, in, a, in a job interview. So, but you should be able to think with me, like, how, how would you do it, you know? Well, the way you do it is you, you have to have a, a variable, something called something or other, that's your variable that is the number you're going to be comparing with as you go through a loop. And if you go, if you start the loop with a for statement, for i equals, let's say, 1, 2, and we'll call rn, rn is a, the, the number of records in a sequential file, right? We all know what sequential files are? Yes. Anyway, you know what a file is, right? Okay, if, if you have, uh, have, have 250 numbers in a file, and uh, let's say that you also have the date also. So you have a month, day, year, separated by commas, and then you have after you have another comma, and then you have, the high, you have the closing price for the day. Okay, so that's it. And then you have each line... Has, uh, has that data in for a year. That would be a sequential file holding a year's worth of data. And you read that in. So now we've got, uh, we've already read the data in. We've got a variable called LA sub I, which is that, that, that closing price each day. So we're going to use an if statement. If LA sub I is greater than this number that we're matching, uh, matching with, max H, then um, max h equals this number, la sub i. We could also save, if we're interested in, save the, the number i in case it turns out to be the highest number so that uh, we would know what the date was, for example. So we could say, in addition, that max h equals la sub i, but you could also say... Um, uh, J equals I. Okay, so that that way you're saving whatever the, 
the subscript is that goes along with the highest number, and you just go through the loop. So you do a, a next, uh, next I, if you're using what I do, which I guess is probably still true in, in visual net. At the end, what you get is MAXH, and MAXH will be the highest number in, that, in, in this range of data, and uh, J will tell you what day that was. So if you did, so if you were to plot MO, which is the month, and day, J, and year, J, for example, not I, but J, you would know what month, day, and year, what the month, what the day was, month, day, and year, and what the, what the highest price was, right? You do the same thing with the low, except that with the low, you're going to make it uh, low X, let's make it just plain low X, whatever. And we'll make that, we have to start off with a really high number, so we make comparisons that go down, and then we put a number in, we put a statement in that says if LA is, sub I is less than uh, max low, you see what I'm doing? And then max low equals LA sub I and J equals I, same thing. So that's how you go find the high and low for a number. And it gets, it's kind of, it gets kind of cute. Because if you get think about this, what you could do, you could, and it takes me years to discover these things. So, you know, if you, you know, so I don't know how quickly you guys can figure all these things out, but it took me years to realize that you can also ask the question is where is the, the current price in, in relation to the high and the low for the last year? How far up from the low to the high are you for the price part? Then you could say, okay, how far are you from the low to the high for the last year is the closing power, right? And you got a comparison or the opening power. And that gets interesting. Then you can start seeing, well, there's a divergence and you can uh, use parameters based upon those, those uh, variations between where you are in the low and the high for price and low and the high uh, for closing power and start looking out, looking for things. You could say that if it's more than a 0.27 or 0.35 variation, then things become interesting. And that's what I do with the software, so that when you get a, a cell signal, here, if we go to the, the min CP, as you'll see, let's find a min CP. These are the worst, so I'm going to go to bear, the bearish min CP. We've already ranked these. These are ugly. But if you go to uh, signals 3, and the first item under signals 3 gives you red down arrows. Well, that shows you that there's a big di bearish divergence between closing power and the price. And that's what you're seeing over here. Now, it doesn't work. The theory that I offer is it doesn't work when the trend is up. But as soon as that trend starts uh, breaking down, you're below the, you'll go below the price moving average that's significant, the 65, then it becomes significant. So we like to go short stocks that have these extra down arrows based on fun closing power divert bearish divergences when the stock goes below it. And we can flag those, and that would be a use of it. Now, how do you put signals on a screen? You know, it seems to me, you know, let's say you test an idea. Well, you, and, and if you look at the research that uh, I did in, the, in this website, you might see some examples. But you should, uh, you should know the hardest part is probably figuring out the graph. Then you've got to also figure out how to put up arrows and down arrows and numbers associated with them at just the right point on the screen. And that takes, you know, a little tinkering. To produce the arrows, we, let's assume that we've got a, uh, we have a subroutine which is going to produce the arrows. How do we, how do we do some of this stuff that I've been describing? Red is good, right? Okay. So let's assume we want to look for S9 signals. How would we find, how do we write a program that puts S9 signals on the screen. Let's, I'll show you. Now, it's a little more complicated, of course, because you have to do testing. But the first thing you, you would go is, I don't know if you can see this or not here. Let me try that. 4 I equals 1 to Rn. So that's the number of records in a sequential file that you're reading in. Now, you've got, let's say we've got a subroutine down here, and it, it's called uh, show S9s. So, so when we have the conditions ready for, for show S9s, we're going uh, to go to that subroutine. So let's put a next statement here. Next I. What comes in here is 
Let's assume we have already calculated a moving average, which is a 21-day moving average, and we call it, we call it, this is the 21-day moving average of closes on the Dow, let's say. Uh, you should probably do some thinking about how you do how you compute moving averages. I don't think that my head will go up far enough to go up to the top so I can work through that, but it's not hard. Uh, let's also say that we have a P indicator. We'll call it P sub I is the current day. We could also have more than that, but uh, and then we have LA, and LA sub I is the closing price. So we're keeping it really simple here. What we would have we would, to get to get arrows on the screen, we would do something like this. If um, L A sub I over the moving average, and since it's a, it's a probably requires parentheses, we'll go like that. If L A sub I is divided by M A sub I is greater than, let's say 1.025, and P sub I is less than zero, we have met our conditions and then, you know, show S lines is the routine we go to. So what you're doing is simply saying, if the Dow, in this case we're using the Dow, is above the, its 21-day moving average by more than uh, 0.025%, or rather 2.5%, if that, if that equation is uh, greater than 1.025, and the P indicator is negative, right? That's what this means. Then, we, then we're going to produce the signals. In reality, it gets complicated because that when you do the testing, and I and what to develop this, I had to do just what you would imagine doing if you're thinking with me. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. Fine. You have to get the data. Let's assume you, let's assume you get the data. You know, I can give you the data to 1965. But you get the data, and you want to do some back testing. Well, you, you, you try this out, you got your, everything works fine, except then you come across a case that doesn't work, right? And a case that didn't work, I'll show you. And, you can see, and, and I'll tell you why. And it should make you more cynical. You've got the great, the great system, right? It's all work, let's just say, and this happens, believe me. It works all the way up from 1929, 1937, and so on. You think, oh man, I can't wait to show this people this. Then you come across uh, uh, 9899. Okay, this is the beginning of 9899. And then we put the advanced decline line on the screen. And what starts to happen is, you see the advanced decline line is starting to lag, right? So you know you're approaching a top. Well, the top didn't occur until January the next year. And for the NASDAQ, until March the next year. So this was very premature. So it used to be, that when I put the signals on the screen, you would get S9 signals here. But I found something out, and I'll tell you about it. If we put the signals on the screen now, there are no cell signals. Why? Because I found out when I did back testing that you want to take into account the four-year presidential cycle. And in the year before the president gets elected, whoever's in office is going to do everything he can to keep the stock market going up. Now, Bush failed miserably. I'm just going to put a, put a period there. But Bush failed miserably in keeping the stock market up in 2007, and in 2007, of course. But things are just, were just coming too unglued at that point. But most of the time, and, and I found out, um, if you look back at, at all the cases since, 1930, uh, since what, that would be 1931, that was the year before election, 1935, 1939, and so on, that the presidents do what they can to, to uh, prevent a market decline. Now, is that fair? I think it is. So that we do not any longer allow an S9 signal in November and December. I'm sorry, in, uh, in the first uh, four or five months of the, of, a pres of the year before a presidential election year. Right? So if we could get through this year, presumably, now the Republicans are, are going to do everything they can to prevent that, but, the, but presumably, if you like the market... So far, they're going to do whatever they can to hold it together for yet another, another year until after the election. Bush proved you can't always do that, and there's some other cases. But the older program didn't know that. So I'm going to ask you how you would program 
th this next statement so that you can kick out uh, in that case. So if we use the old program, and this is the one from 2006, before I got the data, before 1965, so I could see the pattern was actually there, you have to have enough data to actually see patterns that would you would miss if you only look at a little bit of data. So if you look at, at the old program, which is an older charting program, and we looked at uh, the same data, 1998-99, got this different scaling, but that same idea. Let's assume that we're in, a, in a, a trading range market. We had to make assumptions back then. Look at all the sell signals that were wrong. See? So you want to take into account, and my programs do, the seasonality, because it usually it works. And I'm writing a book that you could see and get someday soon, I hope. And I think it'll be a bestseller in terms of market predicting. But it talks about seasonality. Now, how would you program? How would you program a statement into, into this, which would kick out the cases for the beginning of a presidential, a year before a presidential election year? Do you know how you do that? Let me show you. So you, I'm not saying this is all important in anything you do, but it gets to a, a difference between visual basic and visual net, which I better figure out. My brain works by using line numbers, Microsoft. And you can't use bit line numbers in visual net. So you have to figure out some other way of doing it. So we'll try to figure out the, a, a new way. Well, what you have to do is to, uh, is to have a new, new if statement. If um, year uh, I think I always get this wrong. I think it's uh, plus one divided by four is equal to the integer of the same expression, uh, yr sub i plus 1 divided by 4. No, not, I'm sorry. It's, you have to let's see, we want to go like this. Uh, then, you're in the bad the year you don't want to count. Then you have to say, then either go to a line number in Visual Basic, or you've got to set you have to have create a new variable called skip or something like that, and make it equal to the one or yes. And then put in here that if uh, if skip is not, you have to put in here if skip is not equal to not equal to one, then no, just, just put that in. Just just put in if skip is not equal to one and these other conditions are true, then you can get an S9. But if skip is equal to one, then you're in that presidential get that year before a presidential election. What happens is you get you, you start thinking mathematically or logically or uh, in this way and you realize that there's so much imprecision you know, on some of the when some of the stations when they talk about the stock market and when they talk about something working, well, you have to do the back testing, and you also have to define terms really precisely. And if you don't do it yourself, you're not going to maybe appreciate that that as forcefully as you should that. Now, I don't think that, that this is necessary. You know, to me, you ought to be able to put a line number in here and just say if this condition is met, then just go to the next record. But Microsoft doesn't want you to do that. But in my days, in my days, we were taught something that doesn't count anymore. In 1978 or 77, when I was taking uh, programming at Olympia Technical Community College, they were worried about uh, uh, the speed of the computer. You're, you're, you're reading in big records for this company you're going to work for. You must write efficient code, right? So. Uh, I guess I was trained that way, and the easiest, the most quick way you can read through a lot of data, and we have a lot of data to read through, is to not read any further, not go through any more statements, and just go down to this next statement, which then kicks you to the next, next, next one up. But Microsoft doesn't see it that way. I'm told, or at least I've read on the internet, that some people think that Microsoft's visual net is not very efficiently written. Well, maybe it doesn't matter anymore, because everybody's using powerful computers in their, in their very, uh, it isn't necessary to be efficient anymore. And everything has to be understandable by the next guy. The thing is, 
But you can't. Main thing is I appreciate is I've got a big job to do the conversion. Yeah. And if some of you are, are good with VisualNet and <laughs> wanted to help me, I'm sure we could work out a deal. Because yeah. there's a lot of if statements that I've got to figure out how to put into uh, make into positive statements. Because my mind likes to see, okay, I've got this signal, but now it doesn't work in 1933 or whatever. And it, and it doesn't work because of these conditions. I'll put in a condition that negates the S9 signal for 1933 and see how it affects everything else. Don't you see? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what do you think? Right? You ready to work? <laughs> well, I, 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 do some, I do some work with programming and more embedded programming more in my nature. Uh -huh. But these days, what people generally like using is like Python or completely different programming languages in um, a lot of the cases. Because a lot of people don't want, because a lot of people don't care for what Microsoft does or well, it's easy. Yes. I usually find, I, I personally like Python because it's one of the most simplest to program. Uh -huh. It's one that it's like you start, it's often you start people out with Python. And the other advantage is that it's portable because it works, it's an interpreted language. So it doesn't run in bytecode like directly on the CPU, it runs using a what, another program called an interpreter. And that works on any computer, that is, whether it's Linux, Mac, or Windows. Do they do graphs? You, you can, I believe there's a, li a lot of libraries that would provide graphs. Well, I, had to, I had to go and figure them out. So. But, but if, I mean, a lot of your work is like proprietary and well, but it's simple. I mean, you know, the, the most proprietary are the signals, or and, you know, the details. Sure. But but once you, if you can put a, a chart of the other, a chart of the screen like this, and you can what put the statements in to put a little doohickey that points down and a doohickey that points up, right? Yeah, there's one downside. Do you think that's easier than to learn the visual net? Yeah, it's easier. It's easier. The only downside is my thoughts will find here. So you, so you guys are rebelling. Well, well Microsoft, there's, there's no work behind Microsoft here, Rob. I, I think the issue you have is that you're good at Visual Basic already. Right. I mean, and, and that's anything else. I mean, you have this this big investment in expertise in what you already Well, I assume that they have to use something similar to this, though, don't yeah, they? it's similar, but then, you know. I mean, how are you going to reference a very well? And, and the other thing is that, like, you see things, what you can do with something like Python, uh -huh. well, actually, you could probably do it with PBNet, but you just want to. Could you produce a graph and, and code it yourself? Well, like, for example, it's a different world. It, like, Google has an API for graphics. I mean, you know, you can say... So you're using a, a, an application that is somebody else has already designed, and you can't tell what to do. You know, you write, you write your code in Python, and you get your data, and you massage your data, and then you call Google's graphics API, That's right. and it sticks a graph on your website. You know, which is I bet it's cheaper. Well, in a lot of cases, a lot of it, a lot of the tools are free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. is that right? Yeah. yeah, like the Python interpreter that we use for everything is, I believe, open source. Yeah, it's, open source. Yeah, it's all open source. So basically, you can just download it, and it's zero cost to you. But there is one downside to Python is that because it's an interpreted language, there is no binary. So you can see what you're doing. So basically. You give someone a program, you show all the code. That yeah. is the one downside of Python. If right. that is a problem, well, that, no, that no. would be a downside. You could, you could run all this on a server, though. You know, I mean, you're not giving anybody anything. Well, well that would be the best thing. thing. Yeah, somebody wants, wants to join forces and put it on a server so that, that then you don't have any data problems. That was the next thing I was going to tell you. Yeah. The, the data um, I didn't do, and it's going to be a, a bigger hurdle. Uh, moving them to visual net. Uh, my, my, my friend Rick Eckert did that, the guy in Mensa, and he worked with a, a, a program off, you buy off the shelf called Procom for Windows to make the connection, because making connections to the internet has often been the, the hard part. This was a hard part for me when I tried to do it. Uh, we have to put the data, we have to get the data from the internet, and what the data are we talking about? Well, we're talking about 10 fields for the Dow Jones average. We're talking about the high, low, close um, the, for each day for the Dow, advances and declines, and also up and down volume in the month, day, year. So we're talking about 10 variables you have to read in, get someplace from the internet. I presently get them from a comp company called Dial Data, and that's fine, but I have to give them to my customers in a, in a readable fashion. So I put them on the internet in, a, uh, in files that are compacted 
and then they, they download these compacted files and they, they go into their computer. No, you just so they, just But I'd like to find a better way. Leave so, everything on the web. You don't so have to the, ever give anybody anything. So the trick is... What well, that would be good, Brian. Yeah. So one of the things I don't know what your hourly rate is, but <laughs> we should talk. I know that uh, my situation is that I, I'm going to come up with a book that's going to show all these things, and if you, you'll see, I think it's going to be really neat because it's going to... Uh, open people's eyes to a lot of things that they don't know already, so it'll be very good. But the last thing I want to do is to create a demand that I can't meet. So if I write a pro if I don't have the program ready for the Windows 8 or 9, then it's going to be frustrating. Somebody's going to come in from the side and offer a, a, a make a, a look-alike program. So but, then ultimately maybe the best thing is you don't have it where it runs on the client computer at all. Right. What you would then do is can use Python for this, is you basically create a server that has your program, generates its graphs, and puts it on a web page. Right. And you but have an interactive web page using, you know, HTML5 or Flash, which is the new well, I, you know, I, you know, I, I haven't thought of all, about all this, but I would like to work with people who know how to do that. And I assume that at at my ripe old age, there are younger minds that are a lot more agile that can figure these things out and that want to. My eye strain, my back muscles, everything tells me, you know, I don't want to. I, I don't want to spend two years doing something uh, from scratch. So, it, you know, it occurs to me that, that would be the best way. But would a person? Let me ask you this: We have a lot of engineers that use the software because they're they're you know they like numbers and they like to experiment and they like to uh, see what happens under different conditions. Could you? Uh, how many people could run the same? Pro could, could run a program off the uh, a server and take care of, say, a, a 100, 300, 500, or thousand people at any one time? Well, that depends. Well, if you've got a lot of people, then you probably would want to plan out um, your server infrastructure on handling it. You have to kind of run some tests. Mm -hmm. You you have to run some tests. Pay attention to what pieces of information. You're looking at specifically, maybe like for example, certain things you can maybe preload into your into your section so that rather than running the code a million times, you run it maybe a few times, and then it and then it just loads into some temporary memory that's instantly called up. That really comes down to you would have to figure out what servers are running it and how efficient everything runs, and you can run. And this is where you get into software engineering and stuff in terms of. Testing how a program runs. But initially, if I just wanted to uh, produce what I've shown you, yeah. you know, there aren't an infinite number of variations in what I've shown you. We're looking at three or four main variables. It's probably pretty yeah. simple. But look, you're talking about, let's say you sell a thousand of these, mm -hmm. okay? At any one time. Oh, well, subscriptions we're talking about. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So at any one time. Right. Ten dollars a month or fifty dollars a month, whatever. Fifty people are going to be doing this. Yeah. At any one time. Okay. Sold a thousand. That's your. That's. That's not significant. No, not I mean, no, I mean it's like I run websites for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know they have a slice of a machine. So that's not much of a problem. Yeah, I mean you could buy a slice of a Linux machine that you're sharing with ten other people. Amazon Web Services. Yeah, or you, or you get Amazon Web Services. So that would be the quickest. Would that be the quickest way also to yeah. to manage the data problems? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's Wait. how people run businesses today. I mean, it, it's like... This is what Don't put the data in their computer. You, you rent a computer that's out there from Amazon. That's what Amazon has a huge business where they do this. Right. They, I mean, they have a warehouse. Who knows where? Well, I'm interested in, in working out some of the details. You know, I like the idea of putting the data on, onto a server so that solves all data problems. And I like the idea of, of keeping it simple, K KSS or whatever, KISS. Because uh, what I showed you is the distillation of 33, 34 years. You don't have to give people, you don't have to waste people's time uh, so that they have to recreate, you know, the same testing that you did. Some people want to do it, that's fine, then they could get a laptop, I suppose, and use the programs I've got. But for most people, they just want to know the conclusions. And having it be on the internet would be really good. And what's the lesson of world, worldwide wrestling? Get rid of the middleman, right? Keep it simple. You know, people want this, that's what you give them. And they don't have to uh, get paid a subscription to data. 
to get to get it, uh, you know, because that was a, always a big problem. People have to pay thirty-five dollars a month to use the database that I use. So that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, but that's and uh, keep your mind open to new things. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Well, you don't have to stop.